So good morning and thanks for coming. Um, what I'm talking about today is obviously climate and the emphasis that I'm trying to do is give everybody perspective. We're inundated constantly on the news either directly or indirectly about things related to climate or climate change. So this talk is to try to give you a basis of the science behind what you're hearing so that you can better judge what you're seeing and hearing on TV and in the other media. This started, um, this slide comes from a NewsHour text that occurred just when I was starting to put together. So I'm going to read it what it says. Most of Venice, Italy was underwater today, inundated by the worst flooding since 1966. Water levels in the famed city of canals reached more than six feet above average sea level, and historic St. Mark's Basilica suffered serious damage. Business owners and the city uh, accused the city of ill-conceived efforts to build offshore barriers. The city's mayor blamed intense winds and the rising sea levels caused by climate change. He said the damage could run into hundreds of millions of dollars. How you react to this type of thing that you see on TV really depends upon your worldview, how you see things, but it also, to some extent, to a large extent, should depend upon your knowledge of the underlying science supporting or not supporting the statement. We see things like this on the media. Here we can see Greenland ice cap melting. Since 2002, we've lost about 3,500 gigatons or billion tons of ice off of Greenland. How you react to that depends upon your worldview and your knowledge of the underlying science. Then we have this that's going on right now. Australian wildfires and climate change are making one another worse in a vicious, devastating cycle. Followed up by uh, comments from a noted client scientist, Stefan Ramsdorf, out of the Potsdam Institute. There's your authority. And further goes on to talk about climate, say that droughts in the country have gotten worse over the recent decades. How you react to this depends upon your worldview and your knowledge of the underlying climate. So does this. Just came out in the Wall Street Journal. 2019, the second warmest year, caps decades of rising temperatures. Ten of the warmest years in their records occurred in the past decade, according to the authorities of NOAA and NASA. Ocean heat during 2019 was the highest on record, Noah's, Noah scientists said. How you react to this depends upon, in part, your knowledge of the underlying science. You'll see things like this that just occurred on uh, January 15th. Uh, temperature changes since uh, the mid-1800s. Again, how you react to this. And then you'll see this. Al Gore giving the final speech at the World Economic Forum just a couple days ago. And his closing remarks, obviously, were about climate. And his quote at the bottom, I don't know how to pronounce that first one. This is thermal play. Thank you. This is Argincourt. This is Dunkirk. This is the Battle of the Bulge. This is 9-11. How you react to this depends upon your worldview and your understanding of the underlying science. Well, what am I doing talking here? I'm not a climate scientist. I just have a BS in chemistry uh, in 1967. I worked for Dow Chemical Company in the science area for 35 years. At my last part, I was a senior scientist of Dow's automotive business. And my duties there, in part, were to talk to the industry around the world and figure out what's going to make them build cars differently. And using that information to go back and tell our company about new product opportunities. That's how I got involved. And so things that would cause them to make cars different are mostly, besides cost, mandated by the government, which are safety issues, fuel economy, corporate average fuel economy, and of course emissions. And this part is where I got first heard about things like what's coming out the tailpipe called pollution. It's the first time I heard carbon dioxide called pollution. It got my curiosity. So I retired in 2003, started, just got interested in this uh, science, and I probably read a couple hours a day on things about climate science. And nine years later, I met these characters back here at this table, <laughs> at least three of them. 
and we were at a conference in Chicago, and they had are part of a group of uh, retired NASA scientists and engineers who um, got curious about the whole issue. And I was talking to Mr. Peacock back there on the airplane ride back, and he said, well, why don't you join us? And thank you very much. It's been a very, very good experience since then. This uh, research staff, after talking to people of different, both sides of the argument, Andrew Dessler from Texas A&M on one side, and I think it was John Christie from the University of Alabama on the other side of the, of the, of the argument, decided, well, let's go study it, see what it actually said. And we set out as a challenge to answer this question. To what extent can human-related releases of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere cause Earth surface temperatures increases that would have harmful effects? And that's been the focus over the last seven years or so. So the questions asked, the answer to the question would be, is the Earth warming? And if so, how much of that warming is due to natural versus man-made causes? And will that harming har that would be good or bad for us? Those are the simple basic questions. If you want to get more information, this is the website that you can go to, therightclimatestuff.com. And uh, this session is being videotaped, and it's going to be on not too distant future, it will be on that site, among a lot of other uh, technical papers if you want to get in more detail about different aspects. Okay, let's talk about the evolution of a, cli a crisis. It really started at about, let's say, the mid-90s with, uh, I guess it was 1988, with Jim Hansen's uh, testimony before Congress, and the topic was then called global warming. But that changed in the early 2000s to call it climate change instead of global warming. Now, as you know, climate is not just warming, it's also cooling, it's also more moisture, it's less moisture, so on and so forth. But it became global warming, it became climate change, then it became climate disruption. Like we've got a stable climate here and things are happening to disrupt the stable climate. Then, lately, particularly this last year, it has now evolved to be the climate crisis. And from that, we are threatening mankind indeed. It's now an existential threat. Not only that, but Oxford Dictionary gave two words, the word of the year, climate emergency. So that's what we're hearing about over and over again now in the media. So the agenda we're going to divide in three parts. The first part is going to discuss natural forcings that affect climate, human forces that change climates, and they do. We do change climate. And then we'll t look about the, the, uh, the impact. How does it affect weather, food production, so on. And in between these things, we'll take a little bit of stretch break, if that's okay with you. We've got different definitions that you may think you know, or you, maybe you don't. Climate, weather. We're going to talk about the NCA, or the National Climate Assessment from the U.S. government. We're going to use the term anthropogenic, which comes after the word anthropology, and acronyms like AGW, CAGW, IPCC, temperature anomaly, in case you haven't heard those things. Climate, of course, is a series of, of what exists over some long-term period. In science, they make that period 30 years. Over a 30-year period, what is your typical average temperature, your barometric pressure, your precipitation, um, your humidity, your winds, and that kind of stuff. So that's climate. Climate is dependent upon, then, where you live, latitude and longitude, how close you are to different land and what type of land, mountains or plains, how close you are to large bodies of waters, oceans, seas, large rivers. Man's modifications affect climate. Solar activity obviously affects climate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can say from this that climate is regional, not global. Climate in, in Texas is different from the cli climate in Anchorage, is different from the climate in Germany, is different from the climate in uh, Japan. It's regional. But climate change is both regional and global. Okay? Just a couple concepts to understand. Here's one way to illustrate it. Climate is what you expect. This is Ed Barrios' backyard. Took these photographs a decade ago. <laughs> Whereas, weather is what you get. 
Christmas Day, 2004. And we got dumped in this place, about seven inches of snow. We never get snow down here. And he wasn't home when I took these photographs. He was, he was in Colorado where he didn't have snow. I thought that was totally ironic. All right. Anthropogenic means simply originating from human activity. And we're going to use the acronym sometimes AGW, which is Anthropogenic Global Warming, the portion of that global warming that comes from man's activities. And sometimes you'll see the acronym CAGW, which means Catastrophic Anthropogenic Global Warming. We're also going to talk a lot about the IPCC. How many people here aren't clear? I'm just curious what the IPCC stands for. How many people know what it stands for? There you go. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a body of the United States um, reporting to both the World Meteorological Organization and the United States Environmental Program. Um, and it was started in 1988. And its charter, basic heart of the charter, is here. And what I want to point out is the charter says that they're looking at understanding the risk of human-induced climate change. Their charter does not include understanding the risk of natural climate change. So the charter's got an inherent bias built into it. The IPCC is not made up of scientists, it's made up of politicians, except there are some scientists that participate in the writing of the report. You get three different sections on it. One is the science behind it, and then other is uh, what the impacts are supposed to be, and so on and so forth, and what to do to mitigate it or to, to affect it. The last two are highly political. The first two, the science, there's really some good stuff in there if you want to go look at it. So um, there is a basis in any story, a basis of truth, and the first part of it has a lot of truth in it. We're also going to talk about a similar report that comes out just from the U.S. government. This is the fourth national climate assessment that just came out. Um, and it's the comprehensive assessment uh, based on, it's an authoritative report. In other words, they claim authority. Listen to the authority. So let's begin. Let's talk about the natural forces that affect climate. I'm going to read this so I get it right. Consider a planet that looks like this. Let's call it Goldilocks. It's a world that rotates around an axis till it's several degrees from the plane of its star, so that any spot gets solar radiation on average only half of a day. It's a world surfaced by liquid water, not too hot, that would vaporize the water into space, not too cold, that would create a surface of a mobile ice reflecting almost all of the incoming solar radiation back from its star back into space. But it's just the right distance from the star which it orbits to maintain a surface of liquid water. Do you think that the liquid water would have a profound impact on Goldilocks' climate? Let's look at this one, which is the big blue marble. Until you see this pers perspective, sometimes it's hard to understand that we can get a view of our Earth, where we live, that's almost 100% water. We got New Zealand poking up here and maybe the Hawaiian Islands and that kind of stuff. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Do you think that would affect our climate profoundly? And then we have this thing about our Earth as it exists today with a concentration of land mass in the northern hemisphere versus the southern, southern hemisphere. Do you think those land masses might affect the climate profoundly? Solar radiation comes from the sun in a broad broadband wavelength, but concentrated in the visible, with tails both in the ultraviolet and the infrared. A portion of that hits the Earth, and the Earth warms up, and it must release that energy back into space. Otherwise, we would burn up. That's the physics of the whole thing. So what comes into the Earth must go out. I want you to look at the different scales here that we have. I'll put this back into perspective as we're talking about perspective in this talk on this same scale. I'm going to use this slide and we're going to work our way through it because it will give you a lot of information at the fundamental basis. And this was done by Keith Trenberth, the scientist, uh, I think back in 1998. It's still valid. And what he's talking about, the total Earth's budget. What comes in on a 24-hour average basis is 
342 watts per square meter of light. Some of that is reflected, and it never reaches the Earth's surface. The total is 107. All of that goes back out to space. Now, of that that's reflected, we got most of that reflection coming from the clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere, and another 30 watts per square meter coming from reflection off the ground. What about clouds? Here's some 12 years of NASA satellite data. Over two-thirds of the Earth is covered by clouds. And this is the part that reflects incoming solar radiation back to space. In fact, we got more inform uh, information in an 18-year period from the Ceres satellite. This is a very startling, alarming slide because of the colors. But let's remember that what we're talking about here is the whites and the yellows are where most of that reflection occurs. And the blues are where we have essentially no clouds. And on average, as we saw from that previous slide, that average of the reflection is the 77 watts per square meter. What about that blue in Africa? Well, that could be the reflected back from the surface. And we again go to the Ceres satellite. And this is what we call the clear sky, where we have no clouds. And you can see by this the reflection coming from the desert regions of the world. The Sahara Desert is blatantly clear in this one. You can also make the uh, Mongolian area in Asia and, and the dry areas of uh, Antarctica. Uh, of, I don't mean Antarctica, of Australia. And you can also see the reflection coming out from the ice caps. Well, you don't have very many clouds normally, Greenland and Antarctica. And that, of course, reflection we saw was 30 watts per square meter. You can't see it, really, on this chart because of the scale that's off the scale. The reason it looks so big is because this view of the Earth blows up the poles. When you put them together in a globe, of course, that area of the, of the caps is not as big. And that's the reason it's, a, it's minor compared to reflected by the clouds. OK, the part that does reach the Earth are those 67 watts that are absorbed by the atmosphere and the 168 watts that are absorbed by the surface. And we can feel that uh, in our daily lives. So what happens? How do we get rid of that? Well, we have thermals, and we have evaporation and transpiration of plants, which go up into the atmosphere where they cool and they rain, and that heat, latent heat is let loose, and it comes back to the Earth. That's kind of a balanced part of the whole equation. But then we have 390 watts that come off the Earth's surface going heading out back out to space. 40 watts of that is as a wavelength that does not interact with the gases in the atmosphere. The other 350 react with the gases in the atmosphere. Some of that goes out to space. Some of it re is redirected back down to the surface of the Earth. And so that's the 324 that comes back down to the Earth, back radiation of all wavelengths. So there's the Earth's energy budget. Why is that important? Because if we didn't have it, we would be a snowball. And so this, this, this um, greenhouse gases are very important to make life possible on Earth. It's a 33 degrees centigrade change in temperature because of the greenhouse gases that we have. So they're good. I wouldn't call that pollution. I would call that being very, very beneficial. This I just think is cool. I put it up there to show all of our weather takes place in our atmosphere, which is just a thin layer on our, on our blue marble. Not much. Our atmosphere, most of our weather occurs in the lower 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, which is called the troposphere. And then we reach the tropopause. And interesting, the temperature decreases as we go up to higher altitude, stabilizes, and then when we go into the stratosphere, it warms up again almost to the point, the freezing point of zero degrees C. Before at the higher latitudes above the stratosphere, then it cools off again as we go out into space. Uh, this is um, how the whole system works in generating and moving heat around the globe. Over the equator, we have hot weather. We have rising, a lot, of, a lot of ocean in that part. And we have rising moist air that rises up, heat, uh, rains out, gets to the stratosphere, uh, the tropopause, if you will. And then it splits and some of it goes to the north, toward the North Pole, and some of it goes to the South Pole. Then it, then it cools off and it comes, descends back to the Earth and we cre create this cycle called the Hadley cell. The split at about 30 degrees north, 
Uh, some of it goes back to the equator. Some of it goes uh, northward to the range of 50, 60 degrees north, where it makes another cell called the ferro cell. And then, of course, over the poles, we have, a pole, we have the polar cells. And you will notice the tropopause is slopes down. The atmosphere is, the tropopause, the troposphere is, n is not as thick at the poles as it is at the equator. So in science, we then don't talk about altitude, we talk about barometric pressure. Don't worry about it, we'll get to that later. This is another look at that. You can see the difference in height of the two. But we also are showing by this look the fact that the Earth rotates, and in that rotation, we create winds. We have the trade winds along the equator that are easterlies going from, for example, South America across the Pacific. And we have the return winds in, in both the northern and southern hemisphere at about 30 degrees, which, which are the westerlies, bringing our wind from us, mostly, from the west to create our weather in our section that we're at. You can see this band of clouds down here at the bottom. By the way, where are we today? We're almost right at that 30 degrees which in some instances would say we're in a dry area, and indeed we are out in West Texas. But we, of course, have another influence, don't we? It's called the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> so there are other things besides this that affect our weather. But around the world, around 30 degrees north and south is where you're going to see a lot of your deserts, if you don't have other circumstances contributing to the factor. You can actually see this zone from space. It's called the inter tropical conversion zone, the ITCZ, and you can actually see the clouds as it builds up over the equator region. And this zone moves with the seasons, moving further north in our summer and further south in our winter. This is just a model. I think I can get it to work from here. I hope I can. Well, I might have to do this just to make sure. This is a model, but it shows these wind patterns, although really what it's representing is the um, rain patterns. And you can see the representation of the winds in this diagram. The easterlies on the equator, the westerlies 30 north and 30 south, and in the bottom you can see the blue. That's snow. So this model is kind of cool. I like it. Okay. So we've got two things that affect our weather. The atmosphere itself and the oceans of the world. Two fluids that interact, and that interaction is very, very important. Pound for pound, kilogram for kilogram, the oceans hold four times as much heat as does the atmosphere. Of course, there's much more ocean than there is atmosphere. There's more pounds in the oceans than there is in the atmosphere. Uh, many, many, there's three orders of magnitude more in the oceans. On the planetary level, the heat capacity of the entire atmosphere is equivalent to just the top 10 feet of the world's oceans. So understanding the oceans is very important. In fact, they're a major conveyor belt of how energy is transported around the world. This is the AMOC. I never can pronounce meridiasi, meridinol, but anyways, AMLC. And you can see what happens here. And we have a video that I'm going to try to play. Um, I hope it works. Let me go click on it here. I think this is way cool. It didn't take that much. Good. It didn't take that much to pull down. And here we can see the visual representation of the AMOC. And you can see the flow uh, on the surface of the Atlantic Ocean going up to Greenland and to Iceland, where it then salt-laden water sinks. And it goes way down to the depths of the ocean. And our depths here, we're talking about over 2,000 meters. And as it sinks down to 2,000 meters, and by the way, the height of the undersea structure is exaggerated, but you get the idea, as it comes as it flows underneath, this deep ocean current makes its way all the way down to the southern ocean that goes around Antarctica. And as it goes around Antarctica, I think we'll get there in a second, past the Horn of Africa, past Brazil, you can see the blue lines way down the bottom. We get the circulation, circ circulation around Antarctica. 
then it flows north into two areas, and a part of the branch rises in the middle of the Indian Ocean, or then it continues back into the Atlantic, and the other part, which we won't see on this clip, rises in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That whole circuit, if you take one drop of water and you follow it, it takes about a thousand years. So the oceans affect the atmosphere, there's a huge lag time in that. And any effect we're seeing right now from the oceans has an element that goes back a thousand years. The big conveyor belt. We have natural cycles in our, in our climate. One of them I'm going to talk about is the SFWS cycle. Does anybody here ever hear of this before? Okay, well this is the summer, fall, winter, spring cycle. <laughs> Aha, gotcha. Everybody's heard of this before. And it swings globally in the troposphere about 2.3 degrees centigrade. But the impact is more in the northern hemisphere than it is in the southern hemisphere. Why is that? Land. More heat and land in the northern hemisphere moderating stabilizing water in the southern hemisphere. So that's the reason there's a difference. But on average, 2.3 degrees C swing. This is the lower troposphere. Then we have El Nino, which technically we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Its frequency is not constant. It can be every three years, every seven years, or a seven year period. And it has a swing about four tenths of a degree C. And we have a couple other ones that um, we're going to talk about today, which is the PDO and the AMO. The PDO is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Who here has never heard of this before? Okay. And we have the AMO, the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. The 20th century warming, last century, was somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 degrees. If these other three uh, variations, cycles if we want it will, were in phase, we could change the weather by plus or over 1 degree C, plus or minus more than the variation, uh, the warming that we had from the, the la during the last century. So they're important to understand. Now this is the El Nino, like, it's not really a normal phase, there is no normal phase, but for the sake of argument we'll say La Nina is the normal phase. And this is what it looks like. We have the, the easterlies coming off the coast of Americas, heading uh, west toward Australia, Borneo in that area where we have this western Pacific warm pool. And with time, it just builds up and builds up. And then, for whatever reasons, not fully understood, it shifts to the El Nino phase, where the winds actually change. Now they're westerlies, heading back toward the Americas. And it severely affects our weather. This is probably a better slide of it. Um, as you can see, the warm pool, fairly warm, 30 degrees C, goes to some considerable depth, over 300 feet, if you will. Um, where it, it finally meets this area we call the thermocline. And immediately at the thermocline we go from 20 degrees C, boom, down to 8 degrees C. It gets very cold. And you notice the fact that the thickness of this is not uniform across the Pacific and the fact that off the coast of the Americas, the thermocline is almost at the surface. What does that mean for uh, South America and Central America? Really good fishing. It brings up nutrient-rich waters. The huge sardine anchovy crop thrive in this type of condition. Then we have a, a change where it goes through a transition until we have the hot spot off the coast of Central and South America. What happens to the fishing industry during this period? It essentially dies. The anchovies go away. They're not there. Think about the cold waters off the coast bringing up nutrients and having the best productivity of seafood, okay? That's going to be important later. Where does the heat come from? Well, the sun, of course. And when the sun comes down, it has different wavelengths. And if you ever dive, you know as you go deeper, you can, get, you can still see, but it becomes bluer and bluer as you go down. Because the blue light and the green light penetrate deeper than the longer wavelengths, such as the uh, infrared wavelengths that we saw all over here. This is where greenhouse gases emit in this range. 
So the overwhelming heat that goes in the ocean does not come from greenhouse gases. It comes from the sun. And that's what builds up the heat, and that's what periodically has to be released. Man has nothing to do with that. Okay, what, for us, what does that mean? During El Ninos, it means we get wet. We have water. During La Nina's, we get dry. It's the way it is in the state of Texas. Now, our Texas state climatologist, Don John Nelson Gaiman, said, yes, El Nino really does directly affect us, but so does the Atlantic conditions in the North Atlantic, the AMO, that we'll talk about. What about El Nino? Are conditions different now than they used to be? Well, this is data going back all the way to uh, 1870. As you can see, there's nothing unique about the super El Ninos we've been recently having. They recorded and they happened back in history. Where does all the heat go? Solar energy accumulates massively in the oceans and is variably, variably released during circulation events such as El Nino, such as we just saw. The upper ocean gets most of it, the deeper ocean gets a good chunk, and the atmosphere just gets a little bit. Okay. We got another one called the PDO, and this was something that was not recognized until, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago by a fisheries scientist looking at the seasonal variation in the salmon uh, productivity off of Alaska. And he noticed this pattern, that it went through times when the waters off Alaska were warm, and sometimes they were cold, and he called that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. By the way, there's a big teleconnect between that and El Nino. They're not separate, but this is a northern Pacific phenomena. This is a, a satellite uh, rendering of that in November of uh, 2011. You can see the coldness off of Alaska when we had pretty good salmon harvests. Here is some more history of the Pacific Decadal uh, Oscillation. You can see the black, solid black line, and we overlay couple things here. I even forgot how to do this laser pointer. This it? Yeah, there it is. We can see, for example, this is the time of period when the Arctic was almost ice-free back in the 30s. Did you know that? What we're doing now is not unique. And then we went through this period when we were afraid we're getting into an ice age. And we got glaciers growing and we got a buildup of Arctic ice. And here we are today. And we're concerned about something we're doing to cause the ice melt in the Arctic region. But it's not new. In the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, we have the AMO, which has a longer periodicity, about 60 to 80 years. Uh, and it would show that we get warmer weathers, warmer waters up in this part of, of the ocean, the North Atlantic. Uh, and it also has a cycle. We've seen about 60 to 80 years. Um, some of it, of course, was crude member, uh, measurements until we got satellites, but nevertheless the data shows this is what the pattern looks like. One scientist said probably more than half of all satellite-derived global warming trends are attributed to the 66-year AMO cycle. That's a natural phenomenon. We have others, and we don't have time to talk about the others, but this one we should know about. Um, it would be the, the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic oscillations that go around uh, the North Pole, and we'll have at times when we have the low sitting over uh, the North Pole, and we get a jet stream that looks like this. Not too much modulation in the stream, fairly mi mild weather where we live. And then it will switch to the cold phase, and we get this type of undulations that occur. It's been hyped over the media this way that we have, lately that we have the Polar Express. And this has got to be a disruption of climate that's occurring. This has occurred throughout eons. This is not a new phenomenon. It is a cycle that nature makes. We must talk about the granddaddy of all cycles, named after Mr. Malekovich, who first, Malekovich, who first saw, found this. And this is what causes the glaciation, glaciations, ice ages. And it's a cycle of 100,000 years. It can swing the temperature 14 degrees centigrade. And that's because our path around our sun is not a complete circle all the time. It varies. And our Earth also wobbles. And out of this, we can discern a 21,000-year cycle. We can also pull up a 41,000-year cycle, 100,000-year cycle variation of the Earth's orbit. Why does it vary? 
because there's some alignment at times with the big Saturn and Jupiter planets. And those masses actually affect the shape of our orbit around the sun, periodically. So we'll go from a circle, and then we'll get tugged out, and we'll go back. And that's enough to change our climate by 14 degrees centigrade. How do we know? Well, we can go back and we can bore holes into the ices, ice caps over Antarctica or Greenland. It looks like this. The band you're seeing here is a layer of volcanic ash. And they can take this and analyze the water and the gases that are in there, and they can get some sort of a story. We call that proxy information. And that will tell us things like this. Uh, the temperature swings as we go through these different 100,000 year isolations. We are currently in an interglacial. The whole thing is an ice age. Ice ages are defined in the period of the Earth where we have permanent ice. And in this period of ice age that we're in, we have periods of warming. We call them interglacials, which is where we are now. And it's called the Holocene. The last one now, about 120,000 years ago, was the Eemian. And you will note here that the peak temperature of the Eemian is more than we are today. A couple degrees. So what we have is not, not unusual. Now we hear about the poor polar bears and how what we're doing is going to cause their demise. I just want to point out that the species is known to have existed for over 200,000 years. In other words, it survived the Eemian warm period just fine. So the melting ice up in the Arctic is nothing new and they did just fine. So the polar bears today, by the way, if you looked at recent data, I mean, how many have heard this on the news? The polar bears are thriving. Raise your hand. Okay? They are. So we don't hear too much about that anymore as the poster child. Um, in Greenland, we can also get ice cores. This is a Greenland ice core. The other one was uh, an Antarctica ice core, and we see the same sort of thing. Holocene optimum and the Eemium optimum on this side. Okay, let's take a closer look at this stuff over this period. We're going to take a look at from present down to, say, minus 1400. And we get this shape. And you can clearly see from this ice cores that we have a thing called the Little Ice Age. And then we have this thing that people have called the hockey stick. Our sudden rise in temperature. But look at the scale now. We're, we're dealing with tenths of a degree. But we can see that. Well, let's go back a little bit further. And then we'll pick up the medieval warm period. And further than that, we'll pick up the Roman warm period. And further than that, we can start picking up um, 8,000 years ago, which would be 6,000 BC, right here, is the Holocene optimum that we talked about. Okay? We've been declining in a downhill slope ever since. In fact, if we go on back further, we can see the end of the last glaciation all the way out about 12,000 years ago when it started warming again. So here's again a, a reproduction of the Vostok ice core temperature. I put the red line on there to give you an idea about the peak temperatures are not unique to what we're doing right now. We've seen them before. Now, of course, it may be that a couple years from now, people will go back and they'll look at the data and they'll say that one time primitive man believed the sun was responsible for hemispheric climate change. Today we know climate is driven by insufficient use of twisty light bulbs. Other proxy data show the same thing as the ice cores, such as here. But what a point I want to make here is that our current warming has happened before. The natural variation is about 0.7 degrees centigrade. Man's attribution must account for the natural changes. It doesn't, didn't just stop because we started burning more fossil fuels. And remember that it's better to be warm than it is cold. Man suffers when it gets cold, as they did back in the modern minimum. Now this is not a measure of watts per square meter coming from the sun, but it is an observation of other solar activity, sunspots. And the reason it goes back this far, because there's a guy that invented a telescope back here, his name was Galileo, and they actually started tracking the number of sunspots way back when. These blue lines I'm going to talk about in a second, but right now we'll concentrate on this. Back in the modern minimum, it was one degree centigrade cooler than it is now, 
and it only had 50 sunspots recorded over a 30-year period compared to the 50,000 that are recorded in our current 30-year periods. These uh, blue parts are what we call the solar cycles. When they started counting, the first one we counted was one. Today we're up to solar cycle 24, the end of solar cycle 24. And you can see that the trend from 21, 22, 23, 24 is weakening. And all these trends were getting less sunspots than we did before. What does that mean? Correlation does not mean causation, but the strong relationship between sunspots and our temperature of the Earth. Some are predicting that we're going to be heading in this direction to another minimum in about 20 years or 30 years. Time will tell. But that's a hypothesis that will be borne out with actual data as we record in the next several years. So, snow might be a thing of the past, but probably not. So, climate change is a natural phenomenon. Some of us have been accused of being a climate change denier, a climate, uh, and just a climate denier. We deny climate. No, we don't. Any scientist I know agrees climate is part of the Earth. It's part of us. It's always there. Okay, let's talk about human forces that change the climate. And they do. To do that, we have to understand how we measure temperature. That's simple. You go uh, put a thermometer outside and you look at it. And they record it down and see how that changes with time. In fact, that's what's happened across the world, but particularly in the United States, which has an abundant number of weather stations. The only people that kind of match us are Western Europe and Japan. And this is what they're, they're like. Now, they're designed for weather, being able to tell you what's going to be like tomorrow. They're not designed for the small differences that we have to tease out of the data for climate. Only a few of these, which are the blues and the greens, have an accuracy of less than, plus or minus less than one degree C. As we move up to the yellows, they have an error of over one degree C. These colors over two degrees C, the reds over, over uh, five degrees C. Errors. They're not designed for the accuracy of data we need for climate. This is the U.S. Uh, Historic Climate Network. This is what you're going to see from a lot of the used as the basis for measuring temperature in a lot of the reports that you see. Now the government recognizes that that's not sufficient for good science and so they have developed this um, U.S. Climate Reference Network and they're putting these stations in pristine locations around the lower 48 in Alaska and Hawaii. And these stations are situated so have no interference with asphalt, concrete, shade from trees or whatever and they're expected to be there for some period of time. They were started uh, about, uh, I think, 2004, and here's what the data shows us so far. In the lower 48 here, there is no trend in temperature. Now, that's not enough to represent climate because we need 30 years, but at least we're getting some really good data that's long been needed. Now, we can also measure the temperature with satellite, such as this aqua satellite that orbits the Earth, and it takes paths around the Earth, and we get the whole Earth, places where you can't put a thermometer, over the ocean, 71% of the Earth's surface, over the poles, very, very few weather stations on the poles. So it gives us a lot of very, very good data. And we look at this data, and I'm going to compare it to uh, weather balloons, which are shown here. The advantage of the weather balloons is they'll give us discrete measurements, say, of the troposphere or the stratosphere, with no interference from um, the, the, the Earth. But the Earth, the interference with the Earth still gives us some good data. In fact, the one that's mostly used is this one that's here. It's the temperature of the lower troposphere. And this is the one that we look at really to see how is it going for us on the surface of the Earth. And this is typical of the data that's plotted since 1979 when we first got satellites. And this is the data that's analyzed by the University of Alabama at Huntsville. And they publish this quite frequently. Um, and you can see the trends are kind of interesting. We had mm, sort of a not too much rise during this period. Then we had a super El Nino, 1998. That heat from the Pacific Ocean that was put in the ocean by the sun is suddenly released. 
And then, we, then, the, then the temperatures came back down, but stable at a new level. And the heat was relatively flat. The, the, the temperature measured relatively flat in this period. And then we had another super El Nino. This period here is, caused, is, is, is called the pause. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what causes the pause in between these peaks of activity by the El Ninos. This is the plot of both the land temperature uh, done by the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. This is NASA. And the Hadley um, Climate Research Unit in East Anglica, England. And they go back some distance. And then we add the satellite data analysis by the remote sensing systems in the University of Alabama, Humphrey, and you get these types of curves. This part is natural warming that occurred up to World War II. There wasn't that much man-produced greenhouse gases at that time. This part is uh, after the uh, greenhouse gases started. We have a flat period here, and then we have this type of curve later on. The IPC contends that overwhelmingly this part was caused by man. Well, what about the influence of this part? It's a big part of the unsettled science that we're talking about. Here are the two curves side by side. This is um, produced by Dr. Lindsay of MIT. And he said, which is which? Which is uh, caused by nature? and which is caused by, possibly, by us? And the answer is, that's nature, and that's more recent. They look the same, don't they? Okay. This part now, we're going to test your climate IQ, what you know. And we're going to go through these questions. What's the main driver of temperature on Earth? Is the Earth warming? How much have greenhouse gases warmed the Earth? What is the dominant greenhouse gas? What's the major source of CO2 emissions? What's the trend in CO2 emissions? And then with that, we're going to look at effect. Will a warmer Earth with more CO2 in the air uh, accelerate sea level rise? Increase the acidity of the oceans? And if that's the case, threat marine plants and animals? What about inducing more severe weather effects? What about diminishing our food crop production? What about disease? What about human death rate? So that's what we're going to go through now. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Extinctions. That seems to be the extinction rebellion that's going on right now. So we'll take a look at that. What's the main driver of the temperature in the Earth? The sun. The sun. Everybody agrees that. Okay, obviously. The output in watts per square meter of the sun hardly varies at all. So one argument is that any variation we see now is not due to the variation of the sun, except we see these other things like sun pot, spot variation and the strong correlation. There's other things from the sun that affect the temperature. Is the earth warming? Depends. Well, here's the proof positive that it's warming. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, of course, we all know that correlation is not causation. So maybe something else is going on here. The earth warming, the answer is yes and no. And yes and no. Yes, because it's warming regionally around concentrated populations. No, because in 2000 to 2016, we had this hiatus, this pause. Yes, because it's been warming since the end of the last ice age. No, because we're cooling since this Holocene optimum 8,000 years ago. So the answer to the question depends. But this should give you some background when you're looking at the news media, what's going on. Human-induced global warming, right here. Or regional warming, anyhow. I correct myself. We all know as we drive from here to Houston, particularly on a summer day, we can feel the change. And this is called the urban heat island effect, and it looks something like this. Rather live in the rural areas than the city areas. And so, yes, that's anthropo anthropogenic warming, man-caused warming. This is a, a study that's kind of in indicative. It's the population of counties in California versus the trend in temperature rise. More population, 
the more rise in the local climates of those municipalities and those counties. We also make land use changes by the way we develop agriculture. For example, if we take the, the trees out, we, de we decrease the cooling effect. If we take deserts and we plant crops, we increase the cooling effect in those areas. So man's activities here and around the globe do affect climate, local climates, regional climates. What's a greenhouse gas? Well, they are molecules that will intercept the long wave infrared radiation coming back off the earth. And when they do that, they're activated and then they throw off that energy. And they may throw off that energy up towards space, down towards the earth. Most likely they will, their energy will hit another molecule and continue the process. Most of these greenhouse gases are three atom molecules such as here. The only major one that is not is methane. And we'll look at that later. That's what a greenhouse gas is. What's the dominant greenhouse gas? Okay. You guys already know, but this one is an article from my favorite um, climate reporter from the AP, Seth Bornstein. And this he, he sent out, and I just, I just had to capture this. We're clear on the cause of climate change, and we're talking about smoke rising from these coal-fired pilot plants. Except, of course, it's not smoke. It's steam. It's water vapor. Now, he's the reason that I really, after I retired about nine, uh, 2003, I started reading his articles and I went, you can't believe this. This is not right. Something's wrong here. So I gave him credit for stimulating me to get involved in asking a lot more questions about climate. By the way, he hasn't changed in the way he reports things. So, heck, the answer to the question is just Google it. Go to Google and you get this type of answer. Number one greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, methane, so on and so forth, except I know this is wrong. And I had to go through about three pages in Google before I found one that I knew was correct from other information that I have. So you can't trust Google. Be very, very careful. This is the correct answer. It's water in the form of vapor in the form of clouds. This is by effect. I think Chip asked the question. This, this is by effect, not by quantity. 60% comes from the water in the atmosphere. Only 26 from carbon dioxide. How many people hear this on the news, in the media? How many people here understand that? Most people don't, unless they've heard one of our talks before. Okay, what's the trend in CO2 emissions? There it is, right there. Oh, you can't see it because it's down at the bottom. There's a thin line down at the bottom, and that's the trend in CO2 emission growth. Now, CO2, and, along with every other greenhouse gas except water, is called a well-mixed greenhouse gas. It means it's dispersed evenly over the globe. CO2 plus or minus 4%. So we'd expect the impact of CO2 increases to be the same, right? Not right? Right. From the period 79 to 07, this data came out, the southern hemisphere warmed about 0 0.07 degrees centigrade. So did the tropics, but the north was much higher. What's warm in the northern hemisphere? Why the difference? Well, some people say, and this shows that difference between the northern and southern, that it could be explained by the fact that during this period, we had the warm phases of both the PDO and the AMO, Pacific Decado Oscillation and the Atlantic Oscillation. They were both in their warm phases. That's enough to explain the difference in hemispheres. But that's a hypothesis, but it's, it seems like a valid one. What's the major source of CO2 emissions? I'll save you the agony. It's outgassing from our carbonated beverages. <laughs> Actually, it's not. Anybody want to fathom that hasn't heard my talk before? Want to, want to fathom a guess the major source? <coughs> CO2? Volcanoes. Nope, that's very, very, very minor. 
major source is outgassing of the oceans and photosynthesis. Volcanoes are a very, very small portion of it. Land use change, we saw some of that, a very small portion of it. Man part of this whole thing is small. And this includes fossil fuels burning. It also includes cement production. For those of you who don't know how you make cement, you take lime, you heat it up very, very hot temperature, you produce calcium oxide, and you have to throw off CO2. And then, of course, all the beer and wine and spirits that we make also naturally produces fermentation, which is carbon dioxide. Nature is the source of the vast quantity of CO2 that's emitted in the atmosphere every year. Here's an example of why. The gas in the ocean, uh, cold water holds a lot more CO2 than does warm water. All that rich nutrient water coming up when we're in the La Nina stage, that water that comes up off the coast of South America and, and Central America, is laden with CO2. And as we'll find out later, it has a lower pH than the warmer water coming up over the tropics. Here's a look at that. I converted the, the, the dissolved CO2 is not, you won't find much of it as CO2, it's mostly bicarbonate, but converted back to CO2, 133 billion tons of CO2 in the ocean. The higher concentrations are in the cold water regions around Antarctica. The lower regions are in the tropical area, such as off of Hawaii, where we have a very important station that measures the CO2 levels. This is a, a budget that I put together for, um, for looking at the whole budget and how the, the cycle works. We have the ocean outgassing, we have the plant respiration occurs at night, we have the biomass decay. And the biomass is not just land stuff, it's also subsoil stuff, fungus, that emits the gas. And then we have the anthropogenic portion of it, man's portion. Of that, of, you know, essentially all but a little bit goes back into the earth. It's sequestered into the oceans and by photosynthesis builds all the plants. I like to tell kids when I'm working with them at the wildlife refuges that the tree they're looking at, the material to build that tree, 99% came from the air. Car the carbohydrates that make the tree, the leaves, the stem, comes from the air and the water that rains down. Only the rest, the minor elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, comes through the roots and soil, uh, not through the air. So on balance, only 14 gigatons are put into the atmosphere every year. Giving you some perspective on this stuff. The anthropogenic portion, less than 4% of that comes from man's activities. And what goes back in, what stays in the atmosphere, the atmosphere doesn't care, nature doesn't care where it came from, man or photosynthesis or whatever. Um, the net of that is less than 50%. So, did I get this right? Over 50% increase in emissions, which may or may not be, you can argue either way, uh, are sequestered. This is made constant, constant, even as our emissions of CO2 have increased. What's the trend in CO2 emissions? Well, we go back to Mauna Loa and we see this trend like this since the observatory began, I think it was in 1958. And we see this trend is about two parts per million per year. Taking a close up, up look of this thing, it looks like this. And what's, what's the jagged stuff? What does that mean? Well, land mass in the northern hemisphere dominates plants and in the uh, in the winter, when our plants are, are dead, or not dead, they're just, they don't have leaves, we generate CO2. In the spring and summer, when they come out, we start absorbing the CO2 with photosynthesis. And you're seeing that natural cycle. It can picked up very readily at the Mauna Loa station. This one I like to use because it takes us back in time a little bit. Here we see a couple of different things on this. First thing I want to point out are these bars, these blue bars. These are the ice ages that occurred. We're in this current ice age right now. There was one about 300 million years ago and some others that we can trace back through paleo data, proxy data that are going back further than that. 
In between this one, we had a rise of CO2 that almost looked all the way up to 2,000 parts per million. Today, we're right around 400. So we were much higher in the past. Why was that important? Well, we had to feed these things. Mm -hmm. And these things were voracious plant eaters. And they needed that high productivity of plants in order to have enough food to survive. And they did, and they thrived during the period of high CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. How much temperature rise will come from this additional CO2? Well, here's the one we've already seen. I want to point out and add to this thing the levels of CO2 that we see here. From the pre-industrial to before World War II, we had a 30 parts per million rise. From World War II to present, we had a 90 parts per million rise. And yet the temperature swing of these two, the natural and this one, look almost the same. The natural processes did not stop just because we had industrial growth. What's the impact on temperature? This is the only equation I've got in this whole talk. Arrhenius did this thing and what he's showing us is the more you put in the less impact that it has. It looks easier to show on this one. The first 20 parts uh, per million, if you will, of CO2 had a significant impact on temperature and then the, the next ones had diminishing impact. The impact um, as we go from, say, 40 to 80, and then we double uh, CO2 from 80 to 160, is the same. So a doubling of CO2 has the same impact. As we go from 160 to 320, the impact is the same. And as we go from 320 up to 640, the impact is the same. That's why this is a logarithmic effect, diminishing returns. Doubling CO2 from 200 to 400 or from 400 to 800 results in an increase of 3.7 watts per square meter. This is basic physics. Or about a rise of temperature of 1.1 degrees centigrade. That's not too alarming. But the IPCC claims there's feedbacks. And they say the main feedback is this warmer, warmer atmosphere allows more moisture to gather, and moisture is the primary greenhouse gas. And so it's not just the direct effect of CO2, but it's the feedback effect. And they said that effect is between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees centigrade in a term they call the equilibrium climate sensitivity. They've been studying this thing for uh, well over 30 years, putting billions and billions of dollars into it, and they haven't been able to narrow that range. The uncertainty still exists. Equilibrium climate sensitivity is the technical term, the change in mean surface temperature at equilibrium that is caused by a doubling of CO2. And it looks something like this. If we go from 400 parts per million to 800 parts per million, we'll see this temperature rise all the way out to where it stabilizes in about a thousand years out. Because we have to account for the long-term response of ocean outgassing and so on and so forth. And that's where we get this wide range, 1.5 to 4.5. Okay? But these are based on climate models. Models are not data. They're useful tools to do what-ifs, but they're not data. And models are not validated. Data comes from a lot of different scientific studies that occurred. And here we show a whole bunch of them looking at the red dots, equilibrium kind of sensitivity, over the last uh, 18 years. And you can see, the more studies we have, the more and more and more these dots are getting to a point where the climate sensitivity decreases. It's not at 4 degrees C, it's something less than 2 degrees C. We have another metric called the transient climate response. Doesn't matter the details, it's just that same sort of thing, that trend is decreasing. The impact, apparently, is not as great as the IPCC would have you believe. Why is that? Because there's uncertainty in things that cool the earth. Aerosols, sulfates coming from volcanoes but also industry, cool the earth. Clouds, well we know if on, a, on a day when we have a lot of clouds and it's cold out, the clouds that we have keep the heat in. And when there's no clouds, or if you're in a desert area, really warm during the day, no clouds at night, it gets really cool. So there's some warming effect by clouds. But the net effect of the clouds is that reflection of incoming solar ra radiation. So the net effect of, of clouds on, on global temperature is a cooling effect that we have. 
Despite what Obama says, the science of climate is not settled. We saw this curve before. Let's update it with some recent data from the Ceres satellite. And this analysis is interesting. They're taking the upwelling uh, radiation from the surface, which is a calculated number, and they're subtracting the um, upwelling top of the atmosphere uh, infrared radiation, which is a measured number, and they get a number for the downwelling IR radiation. This would be the true greenhouse effect from the greenhouse gases. And it's only 158 watts per, uh, per square meter. Less than the slide that you saw before. So what? So we can look at the whole Earth and we can analyze it and we can say, and this is probably one of the most important things for the whole presentation today, that the warming of the Earth is not uniform. We say the Earth warm, it's been its warmest than ever, it's not uniform. So we take a look at this curve and what it tells us that over the tropics, uh, 168 comes in, but because of the tilt and clouds and everything else, it's different over the cloudless Antarctic and the Arctic. There's less of the radiation. The land gets something in between. The ocean as a whole is uh, a little bit above average, as is the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is below average. Of this 158, the estimate is most of that is due to water, either in the form of clouds or to water, va water vapor in the atmosphere. Only 20 watts, more or less, comes from the well-mixed greenhouse gases. And if we look at, play the hypothetical, what if we added 3.7 watts per square meter to the Earth, that would raise the temperature on average again by 1.1 degrees centigrade. This is what it looks like. The added CO2 would cause almost no warming in the tropics. None. It would cause a lot of warming in the poles. The Antarctic would warm from, geez, minus 60 degrees centigrade to minus 58 degrees centigrade. The Arctic, almost degree centigrade. The warming is not uniform. On the land, uh, is higher than it is in the oceans, on average, 0.2 degrees centigrade. The northern hemisphere warming a little bit more than the southern hemisphere. When I see somebody says, well, how's climate change affecting the toad in Central America? I would say in Central America, there's no climate change. In the tropics, they have no effect. In fact, in Texas, since 1900, at least according to talks with John Nelson Gaiman, our, our chief scientist, state, state scientist, climate science, there isn't much change in temperature in Texas. So when you hear about this warming thing, and the warmest ever, the answer is where? Relative to where you live. It's not uniform around the globe. Okay. According to the physics of all this stuff and the models, the warmest spot that we, point that we should see would be a warming of the mid-troposphere. That's around an elevation of about 200 millibars uh, over the equator. We go here, we have the North, North Pole and the South Pole over here, 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. And in this region right here, between 30 north and 30 south, we should see a warming. This would be the humidif humidification effect that they talk about. The actual data says, uh-uh. We can't find the warming. But again, this data only goes to 1999. So let's go to the more modern data. It goes all the way out to 2013. This is a very busy slide. You're not going to be able to see it. But we're going to look at this one right here, which is 20 degrees. And I'm going to take this one and throw it on its side and blow it up so you can see it better. This again is the tropics. This on this side is the uh, degree C per decade that you expect to see. And what you see here is this blue, which is natural warming, which is essentially not much change at all according to their models. And then we see what the greenhouse warming is according to their models, and we can see a tremendous change. And when we add them both, we get the red curve, which says all the warming is coming from greenhouse gases. And this is what you hear on the media and from the IPCC. Except when we put weather balloons up, we can't find the heat. Actual measurement says it's not there. Okay, what about all these runs that we have? 
they run lots of climate models. And it's very interesting on this thing. If you ever do any modeling, you're going to look at, you see the models come in of the approaching hurricanes, right? And you see the map and you see the spaghetti. And all these things have a different projection, but they're all based on physics. Well, the same thing are these climate models. Why is this one more correct than this one? Well, they don't know which ones are correct. <laughs> So what they do is they do the center line measurement like here, and that's what we're using today to develop policy around the world, a contrived number. And yet, they don't agree with the balloons and the satellites. There's a significant difference. One's pretty close. It's the Russian model. It could be because their physics that they have in there is better, or they got lucky. We don't know. The IPCC becomes more and more convinced they're right, starting with the first assessment report, the second assessment report, all the way down to the fifth assessment report, where we went from they're confident it's man-made to 95% that the warming that we see now is due to man's activities. And yet, the difference between measured reality and what they're showing is increasing. Now, let's update this thing to more modern uh, numbers in 2018. This is global. We look at the spaghetti, we look at the average they're using for policy versus the satellite analysis and the balloon analysis. Here they're showing a warming of two times what the actual measurements show us. Same thing if we want to do the tropical only in this case. Here we're showing the difference between uh, the models and reality being 2.4 times. Well, that's okay. We're coming out with the sixth report. It's just about ready to come out. And we're getting a peek at the new models to see how they handled the situation. And the way they've handled the situation is worse. The global, instead of being a 2 degrees C differential from reality, is now 2.4 degrees C. So they're making policy based on models that don't reflect reality. We ought to be concerned about that because it's going to cost you a lot of money. And people are going to die because of it. Okay, we talked about the pause before. What's causing the pause? Uh, scientists like Trenberth and others say it's going in the oceans. But we've already seen that the gases uh, going into the oceans, the infrared gases, don't have nearly as much effect as, so as solar radiation. So uh, what's going on? We need data. Repeat this again to remind you that it's the uh, visible radiation that penetrates and, and brings work to the ocean, not so much the infrared, which maybe is effective if you have strong waves and stuff down to about 30 meters. So the hypothesis really requires data for validation. Where do we get the data? Well, today now we've got a wonderful system called the Argo floats, shown as here. And they're released from ships and they drift over the oceans and they descend to a depth of about, most of them about a thousand meters. They drift for about nine days and then they're programmed to sink down to the 2,000 meter depth and rise. And as they rise, they're collecting data on salinity and temperature. And they come to the surface, they pop up to the surface, and they transmit that data. And there's almost 4,000 of them now around the Earth. That's a lot of data we're collecting. But remember, any one of these dots covers an ocean area no smaller than the state of Connecticut. So there's still a lot of open ocean when it does this stuff. But it's a lot better data than what we've had before. Here's what the earlier ones showed. And this is going down to the 700 meter depth uh, from 2004 to 2012. No difference in heat content. Here's what latest data shows. And this is just published, so I'll show it here. Keep in mind that the Argo floats only start it right here. The ones going down to the depth of 2,000 meters only start here. So this data comes from other means, like taking a bucket from a ship and measuring the ocean content from a ship, or just putting periodically something down to the depth and bringing it up. But there's very sparse measurements in this part. But we'll take this for what it is. This is measured in zettajoules. What's a zettajoule? Well, a joule is a measure of heat, and a zettajoule is 10 to the 21st power measurement of heat. And that's a lot of measurements. That's a big number, scary number. Except they don't measure zettajoules. They measure temperature and salinity. So one scientist took this data and converted it back to temperature. And this is what you get when you look at temperature. 
He'll tell you that over the last 60 years, the top 2,000 meters have warmed by one-tenth of one degree centigrade. Are you alarmed? A lot of heat capacity of the oceans. Looking at the different oceans, it's not uniform. If this is caused by greenhouse gases, well mixed, they should be around the Earth, but we find the major oceans of the world, the Pacific and the North Atlantic, have no trend. And we do see a warming trend in the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. Don't know why, but the Southern Ocean affects the ice, uh, the ice, floating ice around Antarctica, for example. So this is the down to 7,000 meters, this is the 2,000 meters, the same sort of thing. The major oceans of the world, not much of effect. So, we're concerned about getting to this terrible off the edge of the Earth, two, two degrees C warming. We're not getting there very fast at all. Okay. Of course, we don't understand all the science, and some people have said this is just Mother Nature having a hot flash. Who knows? Okay. Will a warmer Earth accelerate sea level rise? According to the historic channel, this is the stuff we see on TV, this is what we're faced with. <coughs> so how do you respond to that? Depends upon your worldview outlook and how much you understand of the science. Let's take a look at the battery today. This is what it looks like. And let's focus on this building here, count the number of floors, and we'll find out that it's 18 stories, plus this other little section. Each story is about 3.9 meters tall, and at that, in that, with those definitions, the sea level rise here is 78 meters, and at the current rise rate, it would take 26,000 years in order to get that deep. I doubt those buildings are going to be there 26,000 years from now. Okay, well, what about all this stuff? 3,500 billion tons of ice melting from the ice caps. Are you alarmed? Well, here's what it looks long term, going back to 1900. Here's a plot of the ice mass loss on Greenland. And here we're talking about a power of 10 to the 15th. Perspective. We talked about the AMO before and the cycles of the AMO. And we need to know that during the warm phase, which we're just coming out of, we do see a net melting of the Greenland and active hurricanes increase during the warm phase. We tend to be headed to a cold phase. What's going to happen? The ice ages, of course, were very significant. We had, during the last glacial maximum, we could stand here in our Gulf Coast of Texas and walk 50 miles, see Paula back there, because we talked to the kids about this, out into the Gulf of Mexico and still be on dry land. And all around the world, we had uh, all this land connected by dry land because the oceans were 120 meters lower than they are today. 400 feet almost. That's a lot of sea level rise. During this period of time, we take a look at uh, England, part of the world, all of that land in Ireland and England and Wales and Scotland was part of the continent. And then in places like Toronto and Montreal, Boston were, had over one kilometer of ice on them. That's a huge mass sitting over them. And then the earth began to warm and went through the end of the last glaciation. And it warmed, and all of a sudden we had this surge of meltwater. And we had the sea level change here measured in meters until we got to about 8,000 years ago. What happened at 8,000 years ago? That's the Holocene optimum. The warm period of our interglacial that we're in right now. And we reached that, that period and essentially leveled off. If we take a look at data from 1880 to the present, and we see the rise rate like this. This is measured in centimeters, not meters, and it's about 1.7 millimeters per year in rise rate. Not much. Now we added satellites to this, and satellites will give us a, a shifted amount, but still the rise rate is constant at about 3 millimeters per year. What's a millimeter, three millimeters? It's about like that, right there. And that's what we're alarmed about. The people in the Netherlands aren't alarmed about it. They know how to handle slow sea level rises. 
This is, for locally, this is the Galveston uh, station, um, which shows us a rise of 6.39 per year, but as the University of Texas says, 1.8 millimeters of that is due to land subsidence. So subsidence is a big deal. What about Freeport? Well, Freeport's were screwed up because we made a change here. And so the numbers change depending upon where you want to look before or after the change. But uh, overall, they're saying it's 4.35, but we still have this land subsidence part of the equation. You take that out, and we're not that far away from global averages. What about further down the coast, where they don't have any subsidence? This is what it looks like. Sea level rise rate, 2 millimeters a year. So it's not uniform around the world, and there's other things that affect the apparent sea level rise, as we're going to talk about it. In Houston, they're sinking. And why are they sinking, particularly along the, the uh, Galveston Bay and the Houston Chip Channel? Because we're pumping water out of the ground and other things. And we've sunk by 10 feet since 1920. That has nothing to do with greenhouse gases, but it is man-made. It is anthropogenic. If we take a look at all the data of our tide gauge stations, and we take out where we have the subsidence part of it, and where we know we've got the land uh, causing uplift, and we're left with this more stable land, we get a variation between 0 and 2 millimeters per year from our tide gauges, which is where people live, not out in the middle of the ocean. So the rise rate is not changing by adding more CO2. Around the world, uh, we go to um, government documents, uh, trends right here, and we see these types of trends. We will see green trends of slight rising. We will see the blue and the purple where it's actually decreasing why the land is rising. This is a rebound from the last ice age. And we can see that up in Alaska and Canada. We can see it all over the, the, the uh, Nordic countries. Copenhagen happens to be right in the middle of the tilt, where it's neither rising nor, nor decreasing. We have other areas like Tokyo, and this area, red arrow here, which really is, should go down in here to the Louisiana coast, where we've done things man-made to change subsidence and change the deposit of soil, because we rerouted the Mississippi River. And so it's a severe problem. It's man-made, has nothing to do with greenhouse gases. Out in the Pacific, we'll see other areas like Malaysia and that, which have a substantial rate of rise, such as this just came out in the media, January 20th, uh, rising sea levels in Jakarta. Well, Jakarta has a severe problem, as do a lot of the other big cities in this area, because they have a severe subsidence problem. And this is on the order of, um, this is in meters, so we're talking about uh, 10 feet, 12 feet in Jakarta so far, as you can see from some of these other cities. This is measured in meters, and this is their sea level rise, which is 88% of the total. So yeah, they got a problem. It's man-made. They built it on uh, soft soil, and they're pumping water and other things out from under, under their feet. So they're sinking. Nothing to do with rising sea levels. It's an apparent sea level because of subsidence. Of course, there could be other reasons why we're seeing the sea level rise. <laughs> the science on this thing is not settled. What about polar sea ice? Is it likely to d disappear, as we've heard from a lot of different people? And if it melts, how much will this raise sea level? Well, here's a chart that shows, it looks like a heart chart, doesn't it? You know, the doctor and stuff. Well, this is the Arctic, and we've been seeing a decrease in the sea ice of about 2.4% per decade. So yeah, it's decreasing. On the other hand, the Antarctic has been increasing until the recent El Nino and we've seen a decrease. But overall, the Antarctic sea ice is, in, is, is increasing. This is the satellite data of more recent trends, but I think it's neat because it shows us uh, two different periods during this, this period, where we take um, the early period and subtract it from the more recent period, and this is the type of graph that it gets. And what it says is the more watts per square meter is the more reflection we get, right? And the sea ice reflects. And so we, where we see the red down here, that's increasing sea ice. And where we say the blue is decreasing sea ice. So yeah, it's a mixed bag down in Antarctica. But it's not doing anything at an alarming rate. OK, so how much will it raise sea level? The floating sea ice, anybody know? None. 
Take a glass of water, put ice cubes in it, let the ice melt, and then measure the level. It doesn't change. Floating ice cannot raise the sea level. So don't get too alarmed. That's not going to affect us. What about plant productivity? We talk about this. Our crops are going to be destroyed. Let's go back in history. There's a period of time when we had much higher CO2 levels than we do now. For example, this period right here was a period where these guys lived. And they needed that CO2 to thrive. During our period of time, when man started coming out from being hunter-gatherers, a, a wonderful thing happened. We came out of the uh, last glacial maximum about 15,000 years ago. We warmed. As we did that, we got more outgassing from the oceans. Remember? Warmer water holds less CO2, so we got outgassing from the oceans. We put more in the atmosphere, and this was the beginning of agriculture around the world, all around the world, just about the same time. In the Near East, in China, in the Americas, in Africa. It enabled our modern agricultural society. Why is that? Well, because as you add CO2, you increase the productivity um, and the net planet of the plant. This is an example of that. As we go to pre-industry, to where we are, to pumping gas into an experiment to show how it grows better. Did you know that hothouses will typically pump up to 2,000 parts per thousand of CO2 into their hothouses so the plants grow better and faster? Most people don't. You don't hear that on the news. Rice. I show this because it's what we call a C3 plant. About, what is it, Ed? 83, 85% of the plants are C3s. As we decrease sea level, and we go back to where we were at the end of, end of the ice age, we're right about here. When we get right about here, all of a sudden, the process of photosynthesis, the reaction uh, with the energy from the sun and conversion of CO2 to the plants is competing with oxygen. And this, this whole process gets screwed up. And we get to the point where we can't grow plants anymore. There's a threshold we do not want to go below. We got close during the last ice age. And as we add more, we can see that our plants grow much better. Here's a study that was done to put this in perspective, adding 300 parts per million of CO2 to these types of plants and these types of plants, change in biomass, 20, 30, 40 percent change, to these types of plants. And of course, everybody picks on cantaloupes and, and pineapples. I don't know what's going on there. But all of them are responding positively, not negative, to more CO2 in the atmosphere. Furthermore, when they do this, their water use efficiency increases because the stoma closes. They can use that CO2 without having as much transpiration, and they can live in more stressed, water-stressed environments. So not only does the temperature help, but their water use efficiency increases, and their net plant leaf productivity goes up. So what does the IPC says? There's increasing evidence that climate change is also impacting agriculture, particularly on some of the cereal crops as wheat and maize. The negative impacts are greater and quicker than we previously thought. And here's the data. Corn crops are up, despite what he says. Wheat crops are up, despite what he says. Soybean crops are up, despite what he says. In fact, it says here that rising global temperature abnormally is not well correlated with yield trend or its annual deviations. Hmm. This is what's happened in the U.S. to our cereal crops, despite what he said. In fact, the whole world is greening. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've developed fertilizers, and we develop genetically modified plants. Of course that's going to have an effect. Why do you attribute it to CO2? Because there's large reasons of the world that we're looking at here that are not fertilized, and they don't use um, GMO-modified materials, such as the Sahal. This data it goes back to 2010. Let's take it all the way up to 2015, and this was what it looks like. The world is, is being fertilized by atmospheric CO2, a, a huge benefit that you never hear on TV or in the news media. <coughs> I wonder why. I've got a whole series of slides that I don't have time to go through, but this is a, an example of the grasslands around the world, which are very important, and so on for broadleaf and tropical and everything. 
the world is greening. What about some more severe weather events? Well, this just came out. It was published in the uh, Wall Street Journal, and they got the data from the Mor uh, J.P. Morgan, which is advising the financial world. And this is what they said. Worldwide extreme events are increasing. This takes us all the way up to, what, 18, 2018. It starts in 1980. So specifically, what events? I'm really digging to try to find this out, and I apologize. I have not been able to figure, get to the heart of this yet before this, this presentation. But I can get to data like this. Here's a headline that just came out. Big destructive hurricanes are hitting the U.S. three times more frequency. Who wrote this? Why, my friend Seth Bernstein. <laughs> but he wasn't the only one. This is November 11th. He was regurgitated by Science Daily on the same date. And they talk about three times as frequent now than 100 years ago. And this got all over the media. And here's where it came from. The very distinguished proceedings of the National Academy of Science. A paper published by Greenstead et al. And it was edited by Carrie Emanuel of MIT. Very, very strong credentials. And here's the data that they show. The hurricanes in the first part of the study were less than the hurricanes uh, during the last part of the study. Except that Roger Pikey Jr. says, no, hurricanes are not bigger, stronger, and more dangerous. I don't, you probably didn't hear this. Who the heck is Roger Pikey Jr.? Well, he's the former director of the Center of Science and Technology at the University of Colorado. He's an expert on trends in severe weather, and he testifies frequently before Congress. But more importantly, the paper that he's referring to used his data. And he says, G19, which is how the, the, the short version of, of, of this, misinterprets and distorts the data. Here's the data. The hurricanes in the earlier period were more frequent than the hurricanes in the recent period. So why are we getting this kind of thing out there? And why don't you hear this retraction in the media? Here's the reason. G19 focuses on economic damage not hurricanes. And if it occurred early and no damage was reported, they didn't include it in their report. Mm -hmm. Further, they count many non-hurricanes in their study, tropical storms and this kind of thing. And fourth, when they talk about economic damage, which is a factor in the way they presented their numbers, they used a lot of things in the more recent ones that weren't available in the earlier ones. So what we have in their study is a big apples and oranges comparison. And we don't hear about these details that matter. Here's the real data. We're looking at continental United States landfalling hurricanes. The scale goes up to eight per year. In a couple years, we've seen seven and six recently. That's all hurricanes. These are major hurricanes. Um, and we, I want you to look at this. We had a period, these are the scales up to four. We had a period of 10 years where we didn't have any major hurricanes hitting the United States. Of course, in 16, 17, we had our hurricane here in southern Florida and Puerto Rico. But there's a whole period where we didn't have any major hurricanes. Here's the global trends to uh, 2017. It's flat. Here is the studies by a, a scientist by the name of uh, Maui, who looks at the uh, hurricane frequency. Major hurricanes in the bottom, total hurricanes in the top. Total hurricanes trend is decreasing. Major hurricanes globally show a very slight increase, but not significant. And when you look at the combined energy of these hurricanes, which is the strength and duration, we get a number called ACE, the accumulated cyclone energy, which is shown here. Globally on the top, northern hemisphere on the bottom, there's no change. There's no trend. So one would have to conclude and agree with the IPCC that there is no significant observed global trends in cyclone frequency. Even the IPC says that. So we wonder where J.P. Morgan got their data but we certainly can cross hurricanes off their list. Well, what about tornadoes, which is a North American phenomenon? Well, here's the annual count of tornado, tornadoes in the United States since 1954. Here's the count of strong to violent tornadoes during that period of time. Here's the count of violent tornadoes up to 2018, starting in 1950. The trend is down. 
not up. So one wonders whether J.P. Morgan got their data, but at least we know it doesn't include tornadoes. Well, we can go to the National Climate Assessment, which is put together by all of these U.S. government agencies, and we can look at some of their data. The summary for policymakers is shown here. On this page, you will see all kinds of charts about different things that would be considered to be changes in climate. What you don't see on this is anything about tornadoes and hurricanes. I wonder why. What you do see are things like this, the U.S. heat waves from 1960 up to 2010. And this is what goes out to the media. What you don't see is this. If we overlay their data, it looks like this. wonder why we didn't see the data from the 1930s, which is a a very, very hot time in the world and in North America. I wonder why they started presenting the data only from 1960. So we can take U.S. heat waves off of this, since they don't even compare to what happened in the 30s. Okay, what about wildfires, 1982 to the present? This is what they show. This is other government data. This is their data overlaid laid by other government data. I wonder why we didn't see the earlier data before significant industrial emissions of greenhouse gases. We talked about Australia at the very beginning. And we talked about the devastating fires that are occurring right now during this season, and they're horrible. In the last couple of days, I looked on the TV and I saw this thing on uh, NPR about the poor animals, lots of animals being destroyed, being hurt. It's terrible. How many of you people heard about the big fires of the 1974-75 season. Raise their hands. Somebody, raise their hand. Leo did. Most people have never heard of this. Why aren't we hearing this on TV? In fact, there's another one that occurred around uh, 2003 that we don't hear about that so far is worse than the one we have today. I wonder why. So we heard about this at the very beginning, and yet we didn't start making CO2 heavy until uh, after the, you know, during the 70s when this occurred, we were talking about the Ice Age coming. So we saw that peak on the last one, right here, about 1975. And then we're talking about droughts. We go into this, and here's Australia. Now, it's very true that this year we have a very, very dry year. But overall, since the 1920s, the actual data shows an increase in moisture content in the continent of Australia. With the peak being right here, 1974-75, which pre uh, preceded that huge fire. They had so much rain that they built up so much fuel loan to burn. It was a wet year that caused the worst fire that they had, not a dry year. I wonder why we don't hear that. This is what uh, our Australia looks like, and this is the pattern since 1998, a 20-year pattern of moisture, and we can see it's growing across the in the central and the western part of the country. It's neutral in the eastern part of the country, right in here where the fires are today. The only place we've seen a dramatic change in, in uh, drying out is in Tasmania. There's hypotheses about why that is. It's close to uh, the southern oscillation, the southern ocean. Could be something there, but we don't know yet. At least I haven't read anything that connects the two. So we can cross out wildfires from the J.P. Morgan data. <coughs> then we can look at uh, U.S. drought. No change, no trend. We can look at global drought trends from the yellow, which are just a little bit of drought, to the heavy colors at the bottom, the reds and whatever that is down at the bottom. And we can see, though, overall, there's no change in global dryness. Um, according to Pikey Jr., who we just talked about, Drought has become shorter, less frequent, and it covers a small portion of the U.S., anyhow, that it reports. And the IPCC even says that they really can't get any trend. Although, they can say that it's likely the frequency of drought has increased over the Mediterranean and West Africa and decreased in North America and Australia. But there's no data to prove and support J.P. Morgan's claim, so we can cross that off the list. There's no data to support that. Well, this is not really climate, but nevertheless, they have it on the climate assessment report. So we'll take a look at the Arctic sea ice. It's declining. Yes, it is. We've already said that. They show this since 1979 in their report. 
they don't show the pink part. If they did, you would say, geez, since you go back to 1973, there's no trend. Wonder why they didn't do that. Why they choose to start their data right here. So we can kind of decrease that, cross that out, because it's happened before in the 30s. So when it comes to extreme worldwide events increasing, well, maybe they can make a claim from 1980 for this, but, but not if you go back in history. It's nothing new or unusual. Sea levels in the United States, they show increasing. Well, we've already talked about this, but here, here it is at the Battery in New York. It hasn't changed in rise rate since Abraham Lincoln's time. We can take sea level off this list of things associated with severe weather events. What about floods? Well, here's the IPC uh, see a statement on this thing. Um, there continues to be a lack of evidence and thus low confidence regarding the sign or trend, that means more or less, and the magnitude of floods on a global scale. FEMA would agree. In the United States, no real trend. Flood damage in the United States as uh, a percent of GDP is definitely on the decline. Here's the frequency and intensity going back to 1950. So, IPCC, there'd be a lack of evidence and thus low confidence regarding the sign or trend of the magnitude of floods on a global scale. So we can cross that off the list. One wonders what J.P. Morgan is talking about. And then we have other things which I won't go into, days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, things, the uh, high temperatures, all of these have the 30s as being the peak, not recent times. So we look at this thing and we can cross heat uh, events off the list. So I'm still wondering where the numbers came from. The extreme weather events, though they got this chart, doesn't fit with the data that I have. Weather related disaster losses are going down in the United States. And what about disease? When you hear about disease, well, we hear about malaria all the time. It's a terrible disease. It's spread by mosquitoes, as we all know. There were epidemics in Russia, Siberia, and Scandinavia back in the late 1800s. Did you know that malaria is not a disease, a tropical disease? It's a disease of where you have these whole circle, the vectors of the mosquitoes, and other things in it. And it declined even before we started using the most effective agent, DDT. Why? Because of sanitation, screens on wind, uh, windows. Where this occurs, malaria goes away. Where it's not occurring is in a lot of Africa, sub saharan Africa, and Bangladesh and areas like that. Okay. There, there is a recent re resurgence. I've seen lots of papers come out or newspaper articles. They blame it on climate change. Everything's blamed on climate change. But it coincides with the banding of DDT, which is another topic in speech all by itself. And the fact that the other agent that was somewhat effective, the uh, chloroquine, has become, the, the disease has become resistant to it. If we use DDC in clean water, we would eliminate malaria and the same thing for dengue fever. It's not, they're not tropical diseases, they're sanitation diseases. Waterborne illnesses, such as bacteria, viruses. IPC claims that war warmer water will increase risk. <coughs> increased flooding will increase risk. These diseases, of course, are caused by bacteria, and there's vaccines now available. Diarrhea is a, a big deal in some parts of the world, mostly children, but they're cured with sanitation. They're not caused by a rise of seven-tenths of a degree centigrade. Summary. Major diseases have devastated the world in the past. No major diseases show any climate preference. And the biggest killers can be tamed with vaccines, sanitation, and health. What about human death rate? Well, here's what you saw in The Guardian. Heat-related deaths will rise 257% by 2050. Here's what you didn't see in The Garden. The deaths caused by cold. Notice that the scales on these things are different. More people die from the cold than they do from the warmth. And of course, modern technology, development of some of these undeveloped countries, will reduce the impact of both of them. So yeah, we might see, the way it is right now, with no other changes in development, 
More deaths from heat, but you'll see a lot less deaths from cold. I wonder why you don't see that. Here's some studies from Australia. These are cities around Australia. This is their winter. Okay? May, June, July, August, right here, the different cities. Death rate goes up during the cold season. From the uh, CDC, we can see that cold causes more than twice the number of deaths than heat. And if we put that on the scale of all causes of death in the United States, these climate-related deaths don't even make the scale. So we'll give you some perspective here. All right, droughts are a thing of the past. We used to have severe problems during that heat wave in the 30s. This is deaths per year uh, and death rates per million. They decline to, they're not a problem anymore. Modern technology has essentially eliminated the problem of deaths because of droughts and our ability to respond and react to the situations. In fact, deaths from climate and non-climate catastrophes, these are weather-related deaths, have just dropped to almost nothing. This is what modern developed societies can do for you. To put it in perspective, we can say it this way. Human uh, prosperity does not take a benign climate and make it dangerous. It takes a dangerous climate and makes it safe. I'm paraphrasing a guy by the name of Alec Alex Epstein for this. Well, a warmer earth induced extinctions. True extinction causes are when we introduce things to island areas. This is man-made, this is man-caused, has nothing to do with temperature. We in introduce predators. We also kill, kill off the uh, carrier pigeon. What kind of pigeon was that? Um, which one? Yeah, and of course the dodo bird and all this kind of stuff. Habitat loss, hunting, water pollution, man affects um, the extinction rate. But there's been no known extinctions documented have been caused by a rising temperature. None. So like I said, you hear about this poor frog down in Central America, and they say climate change is causing it to, to die. Sorry folks, there's no temperature change. In, in the tropics. Think of something else. Okay, what about the last one here, ocean acidification? For perspective, taking us back to, to, to junior high, if you will, the, the range of acidity is, is, is measured on the pH scale, neutral being 7, and the oceans, we're told, have an average pH of 8.1. But of course, this is not linear. It's on a logarithmic scale so that the change from 8 to 7 is not 1, but it's 10 times. What is the pH of the oceans? Just like the temperature, it varies location, location, location. And here we take a slice of the ocean from Alaska to Hawaii, and we look at it with Hawaii being on this side, and Alaska being on this side, and we look at the pH as we go down in depth and as we move from north to the tropics. We said the pH average, or the literature says, is, is 8.1, but no. The pH average of the ocean varies where you are. With Alaska being much lower pH, you know, all the way down in this range, than off the shores of Hawaii. Where's the better fishing and seafood industry? Hawaii or Alaska? Where's the most productivity? So we got this lower pH, not acid, will never acidify the ocean. There's too much uh, salts in the ocean to buffer that condition. But the pH is not a, something to be concerned of. Ocean uh, animals thrive in that. So if we take a look at the most productive areas, the Grand Banks, the Georges Bank, um, the, the uh, Irish Sea, Dodger Bank on the North Sea, the only one that doesn't fit this thing would be uh, the Bahama Banks. All these other areas have rich, rich production. They're the ones with more CO2 in the water as carbonate or bicarbonate. I could, you know, th this is a whole other topic by itself. But this is the show that a lot of animals will thrive in these waters that have more CO2. Nothing to really be alarmed of. And we can go into the whole thing about coral reefs. 
That would be a whole other topic. Just remember that this particular mountain that we have in West Texas, El Capitan and the Guadalupe Mountains, it remains of a fossil reef that was formed 260 million years ago when the atmospheric level was 2,000 parts per million. So the most controversial points can be summed up this way, but three overriding issues. Whether the warming since 1950 has been dominated by human causes. Some of us think not. How much the planet will warm in the 21st century? And to the extent to which further warming would be harmful or beneficial to humans, to where and to whom? The science is not settled. So, we started with Judy at the very beginning. Let's end with Judy. The mayor blamed climate change. What nobody, I heard nothing on the news, was this. And this is the situation. In Venice. They're sinking. Mm. They have substantial subsidence that's going on. And I looked for different channels to find anybody talking about this, and I couldn't find it. In fact, the whole Mediterranean is variable. And while off of Venice, it may be uh, sinking, and they have a true sea level rise off the tip of Italy. We've got some uplift going on. So there's a whole lot of tectonic action that's going on in this area. We hear a lot about the Paris Climate Change Conference. If everything was enacted according to this scenario, which they call the uh, RP, Representative Climate Pathway 8.5, that means a warming of 8.5 uh, more watts per meter into the atmosphere. And anybody that looks at this stuff knows this is highly, highly, highly improbable. It's not even realistic. But that's the curve that they're using to make policy around the governments of the world. Those models, which they take an average, which are warming more than reality, and things like these projections right here. But if that was correct, and if all the countries of the world abided by their, their obligations, this is what we would see. 0 0.05 degrees C change in temperature. And yet we will destroy a lot of economies, destroy the means of productions and livelihoods if this occurs. And if we extend this off to 20, the year uh, 20, 2100, it's not even two-tenths of a degree C. We've already warmed by one degree C. So what's this all about? In conclusion, we know that CO2 emissions are up. So is the population. So is the GDP per person, our well-being, and so is life expectancy. So there are a lot of things are good going on because we have developed economies. A lot of it based on, entirely based on fossil fuels. In, in, in conclusion, it's called weather. <laughs> what we're talking about. I'll leave you with this. What if I don't trust the economic models? Who hired the science to, to know Irish? We have this at the end from the United Nations. Redistribution de facto of the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has, this has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. Which leads me to question, perhaps this is the real existential threat. Thank you. Any questions?